Hi, Pam. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright. Uh, this is The Wright Show. You are Pamela Cooper White. Uh, you are at Union Theological Seminary, where you are the Christian Brooks Johnson Professor in Psychology and Religion. I'm also at Union, a visiting professor of, uh, of uh, science and, and religion. Um, and we, in fact, are just across the street from each other right now. Um, you're also the author of The Cry of Tamar, Violence Against Women and the Church's Response. Uh, which was published a while ago, but I think has came out in a second edition or something, right? Because right. That, that, that book has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, a book of essays called Braided Selves. Also a book, uh, and I think I have a copy floating around here somewhere, called Shared Wisdom, Use of the Self in Pastoral Care and Counseling. And that would be this. Yes, I recognize that. You do? Does this look familiar? It does. Good, because I was going to ask you a question or two about it. Um, but let's start at a more general level. So you are a professor in psychology and religion. Uh, could you tell us a little about what what that means? I mean, I, I, it could mean a lot of things. I think when a lot of people think of psychology and religion, they may think of the psychology of religious belief, uh, you know, kind of William James type stuff. Um, I don't think that's mainly what you do, but it may be one thing you're interested in. I don't know. Uh, what what kinds of topics has, has that job description led you into? Well, as you know, this is my first year in the position, and uh, the title has actually even just recently changed. It has a long history that's kind of idiosyncratic to Union. Uh, it was called Psychiatry and Religion because of the people who founded it and the paradigms that existed in the time that they did that. Uh, and it was uh, people like, like Paul Tillich, the theologian, and uh, psychiatrists in the area who wanted to find some way that the disciplines of psychiatry, particularly the psychoanalytic paradigm that was uh, the reigning paradigm at that time, and theology could have some kind of integrative dialogue together. So that's the origin of the program here. Uh, what I actually teach uh, under the umbrella of psychology and religion is quite broad. Uh, it kind of moves in two veins. One is more the area of what we would now more likely call pastoral theology and care and counseling, where it is the preparation of people for ministry, drawing on both the traditions of psychology and the traditions of, of their theological faith and finding methods for bringing those things together in the care of persons and communities. So that's a, a big part of what I do. And then the other part of what I do uh, remains true to the origins of this tradition at Union, which is talking about psychoanalytic theory in particular, uh, really grounding people in psychoanalytic theory and how that continues to be in fruitful dialogue with whether you would call it theology from a theistic point of view or spirituality or some understanding of how the divine or the sacred interacts in human life. So we have kind of two pathways within the larger tradition of psychology and religion here. And the one we do the least is actually that kind of William James phenomenological study of the psychology of religion or mm -hmm. uh, religious experiences in, in psychological perspective. But, you know, little bits of that, of course, do come in as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's at least two big subjects there intersecting with psychology. One is pastoral care. Uh, one is theology. Um, pastoral care is mainly what this book is about, although it gets into theology. Um, why don't we start off, uh, before we get to theology, talking about that. And first of all, the whole idea of pastoral care, because, you know, I think some people, when they think of a minister, they think of somebody who preaches that's, in fact, that's what I mainly remember about ministers from my youth. When I went to church, the preacher was somebody who preached. Uh, he also baptized me when I was nine. I remember that. But aside from that, I don't remember him doing much. He didn't counsel my family at least much. Um, I, I, later at a different church, when my father died, the preacher was very much involved in consoling my mother. He was at the hospital when my father died. So I guess I did become aware of kind of pastoral care and counseling at some point. But I still think it's something that often operates kind of under the surface in a way. I mean, it's not the most conspicuous thing 
that a minister does from the, you know, viewed from the outside. But it's a pretty big thing, I guess, right? Depends on the particular pastor, the role of the clergy in a, in a given religious institution. When you have a larger kind of institution with many people on staff, often it's a specialized ministry of one person who has gifts and experience and training in that. Uh, often the person who functions best in the kind of CEO role of a senior pastor or the dean of a cathedral, for example, might or might not also have those gifts and not be interested in doing that work so much. So it really depends on the coming together of the temperament of the clergy person and the specific job description that they're occupying within their institution. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we're trying to do here in the pastoral care courses, of course, is to give people a, a taste of how to do that in a careful and compassionate way with parishioners, regardless of what position you find yourself in, because people will turn to you uh, at times of crisis, especially around some of those existential questions of meaning and purpose, and why did this happen to my family, and how could God allow this? And mm -hmm. so we actually have some evidence um, in crisis work, for example, that the clergy are actually the first helping professional that many people will go to before they would think of telling their doctor or a therapist about a problem that's really disturbing them emotionally. Hmm. So clergy actually hmm. tend to be the front line for many people around issues of ultimate concern, as the theologian Paul Tillich put it, and also just um, issues of healing and emotional distress. That's interesting. Because one thing I realized uh, in, in looking at your book is that, uh, you know, what now a lot of people turn to therapists for, for much of our history, people have turned to pastors for. And uh, I guess there, there are, what you're telling me is there are some people who turn to both, but there's a tendency to turn to pastors first, which is, which is interesting. Um, among, among people who are believers in a given faith tradition. Sure, sure. People yeah. who have both uh, at their at their disposal. Um, well, and some of that may also be the history of religious traditions that it would almost be considered a stigma to go outside of that because in some ways the church might be functioning for people as an extended family and you wouldn't want to take your problems to someone outside of that circle that that could even be shameful to do, and so the idea is sort of trying to keep it at home. Uh -huh. And of course, if you have people who are untrained in the clergy who don't know the first thing about how to respond, except from sort of a, a gut-level response, they may not know how to respond well to a given situation. And in some cases, uh, for example, domestic violence, which I've worked with a lot over the years, um, they can actually do harm with the intention of doing good. In, in what way? Well, I mean, we've heard many, many horror stories uh, from battered women that they went to their pastor and they told them, you know, my husband has a terrible temper, he's beating me, um, he's doing these horrible things to me, and the pastor tries to uh, kind of explore with them, well, what might you be doing to contribute to the problem instead of considering her safety? Uh, or even worse, well, you know, if, if you just go home and pray harder for your husband to come to Jesus, then he will convert and he won't do this anymore. I mean, these are really dangerous, perhaps well-meaning, but very, very dangerous interventions. And when someone comes to a clergy person with anything that has to do with their safety, mm -hmm. then that has to be something that is taken seriously first and foremost and how do we get this person uh, this person's children say someone is suicidal what do we need to do there are actually steps that you can take to give the best assurance that this person is not going to commit suicide and to prevent that and there are tested methods for doing that and most people who haven't had the training just don't know what they are mm -hmm. and that includes most clergy so, so there are cases where theology, or at least religious belief, more broadly, can get in the way of effective counseling. I guess what I would want to say is not so much 
that all theology gets in the way because I also see theology as potentially very, very empowering. Uh, but particular interpretations of sacred texts, for example, uh, reading the text in Ephesians about women, wives be subject to your husbands, if you only pull out that one sentence, mm -hmm. you might not see that the sentence right before it is husbands and wives be subject to one another uh, for the love of Christ. Mm -hmm that puts it in a whole different framework and that actually the passage for its time was revolutionary in that it was talking about a mutuality of relationship that mostly didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So I, I think in many cases we take doctrine and we take biblical interpretation to shore up our own ingrained social and cultural and political views. And if those views happen to be, for example, patriarchy, then we can find ways to use the text and use the doctrine to continue to just perpetuate that narrative. But in reality, theology can be incredibly empowering if you go back in and you reinterpret the texts and you interrogate the doctrine and you ask the questions about what is really serving life here. And there are many resources in every faith tradition that can also be used in that way. So I don't think it's theology per se that's the problem, but it's it's our human use of it and the way that our theologies get captive to our cultural and political paradigms. Okay. What's a, a particularly good kind of robust use of theology? Does one come to mind? I, I mean, one that is kind of life-affirming in the way you suggest, or, um, I mean, there may be one from your book. There, there are these kind of hypothetical case studies you go through in your book. You start the book with four cases of, uh, of uh, I guess they're all ministers, aren't they? All four of them who, 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 are, who face situations involving either parishioners or church staff or something that are kind of complicated, and then you follow, follow them through the book. Is there, is there a kind of, I mean, is, is there a textbook example of like a good constructive use of theology? Well, I don't want to say those cases are not good examples, but um, what actually comes to mind more in terms of a good use of theology per se would be where, I'm thinking of a different person that, that I didn't write about in that book, um, a person who was, she had a terminal diagnosis, and we had many long theological conversations. She outlived her diagnosis by many, many years, actually, and her faith was very strong, uh, and she had a very clear idea of, of how, her, how her faith was constructed. She had a personal relationship with Jesus, and she felt very strongly that she and Jesus talked together when she prayed and all of that, and yet there was another side of her that was rather anxious that because she was a lesbian and because she had left her marriage at a certain point in her life that perhaps there was punishment involved in, in what she was experiencing now with her cancer diagnosis, and so that would be a place where I mean, it wouldn't be a soundbite, but, you know, to have conversations exploring what was her understanding of Scripture and what was her understanding of the Church's teachings that led her to believe that God would be punishing her for living her life as a whole person with all of, all of the gifts that she had and her uniqueness. Mm -hmm. And fi on the contrary, finding then other passages that could counter that and say, you know, it feels to me like this is stuff that's coming up from what you learned, you absorbed from your family, from the culture, that being gay isn't okay, and yet everything that we're looking at in terms of both the church's tradition, we I happen to be an Episcopalian. Um, yeah, and we should add, by the way, you're, you're, you're an ordained priest, right? Yes. Okay, yes. So, which gives you a, a, a second kind of authority when you speak <laughs> about these matters, yes. Well, and the way you use your authority also in ministry, whether lay or ordained, I mean, if you're a lay chaplain as well, but you've, you've got that little button that says, I'm a chaplain, mm -hmm. signifies that. You don't have to hammer people over the head with correct theology because you've already walked in the room and you're carrying that sense of authority in the best way, not in an, 
not in an abusive or exploitive way, but in the best way, you have an authority that comes from your training and your experience. And so when you raise issues with someone or you listen to them and you say, well, you know, it sounds like you're being really hard on yourself right now. I actually believe in a God who doesn't punish people, but loves them for who they are. Mm -hmm. How does that sit with you? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, to explore together, what does that sound like? Does it sound like something that she'd love to believe for everybody else but can't apply to herself? Hmm. Or is it something that over time in a caring relationship she can begin to integrate that? And, and to some extent then I think the compassion of the caregiver does become internalized in some way as a reflection of God's love. Mm-hmm. I don't think we walk in with all of the hubris to say, I am here to give you God's love and I'm going to put it in you. That mm-hmm. would be kind of counterproductive because it would be about my power but to try as best as possible to open a space that's safe for people to experience the love of the holy in their own lives and and to have ways of talking about that that help them reconnect with that inside themselves I think that is a big part of the mission of pastoral care and so theology comes into that because there are theologies and ways of framing the way we understand God, that are much more life-giving than others. Mm-hmm. And is this, a, is this a common kind of role with whatever their theology is, unless I'm hearing something that feels to me like it's really constricting or really self-defeating, and that's probably when I would begin to intervene a little bit. But otherwise, I'm going to try to be with the person where they're at and not try to impose my own sort of you know, systematic theology ideas on them. It's mm-hmm. not necessary that we all believe the same way. No, but it does sound to me like in this case, and I would suspect generally, you're encouraging a conception of God as a loving and not terribly judgmental uh, God, r- r- right? And, and, it's, and, and it sounds like maybe a common issue you face is people um, who are thinking of God as... Uh, highly judgmental, either either just in their case or or more broadly, as you said, it may be that, that that they think God is is unconditionally loving with everyone other than them, or they may they may just think that the Old Testament God is the one everyone has, or whatever. But um, but uh, so it sounds like you you know th- this is a common. Well, you tell me how common is it that people are saddled with you know burdensome guilt or whatever that's correlated with, with this particular theological conception that you think they might be better off without? Well, more often than you'd think, and I, I've encountered it much more working with people in congregations than I have as a therapist, even though I'm also, when I was doing therapy with people, I was doing it as a pastoral psychotherapist, and they knew that. So they knew that it was a faith-based organization where I was doing my work. Uh, but there would be long stretches where therapy patients, we wouldn't be talking about overtly about matters of religion at all. So I don't see pastoral counseling in the same mode as a more conservative kind of Christian counseling model where the way you work is prescriptive. You tell people, here's what's here's what's going on, here's what God has to say about it, here's the biblical passage mm-hmm. that will help you get out of it. I mean, I think that's frankly authoritarian, and it's it's bad psychology and it's bad theology. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, my approach is much more exploratory. Mm-hmm. But underlying everything that I do, because of my training and my identity as a pastoral theologian and a pastoral counselor, I believe that there is something that's sacred that's going on in the conversation. And I believe that that sacredness is holding the conversation and it's helping me to be safe as I keep things safe for them. So I'm leaning back on the tradition. I'm leaning back on my faith, even if we're not talking about anything overtly related to that at all. But of course, I think when people are in congregations and you're actually their pastor or their priest, uh, then they may be more likely to be coming to you with explicitly religious concerns and questions, and so that becomes a part of the work, mm-hmm. too. I'd like to go back to something you said earlier about the Old Testament God, though. Yeah, I, I wondered whether I should say that. For various reasons, I'm probably better off not putting it that way, but you kind of know what I mean. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that I think that um, there is a problem and with... Uh, pastoral care as a profession in this country, the way it's been uh, 
well formed as a as a profession, formed as a discipline, is that it's been highly dominated by Protestant Christians, and that with that comes a lot of baggage that may not even be conscious for a lot of people, including assumptions about what God is like, um, how God operates in people's lives. There are a lot of Christian paradigms for understanding that and then kind of using those to get inside what's going on with the person that you're helping. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, one of those tropes that's not so helpful is supersessionism, which is a kind of form of anti-Semitism that, mm -hmm. well, now that we have Christ... That, that's what I had in mind when I thought I probably shouldn't use yeah, the phrase yeah. Old Testament God, but go, go ahead. But interestingly, I mean, I, I use a lot of Hebrew Bible imagery in my own reflection about pastoral care and, and psychotherapy because um, there are notions like uh, rachamim is the word for compassion. It also means womb love, mm -hmm. the love of a mother for the child in the womb. And, and that is what God's love is understood to be like in, in Jewish tradition. So this notion that Jesus replaced a wrathful, judging God with a loving, merciful, forgiving God is really a cartoon of comparison between the two faiths that doesn't hold up under scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, on this idea of, uh, of a wrathful God, though, a kind of guilt-inducing God, one reason I asked this question is because, um, you know, I had a debate with Sam Harris, the famous new atheist uh, in Los Angeles some years ago, and, of course, one characteristic of the new atheists, as opposed to the old atheists, is that the, the new atheists, uh, it isn't just that they don't believe in God, but they, they feel uh, that it's important to go around uh, persuading other people not to believe in God. That, in turn, rests on their belief that religion is an inherently bad thing. And they have, uh, one thing I learned during that debate is that they have very passionate followers. I mean, when you are when you're with a new atheist, uh, uh, you know, in dialogue or something, and the crowd is mainly new atheists, anything they say virtually will be wildly applauded. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a fervor reminiscent of religious fervor. And one thing I learned uh, in talking to some of these people is that a lot of them, the source of their fervor is that a lot of these people feel they were damaged personally by religious upbringing. And I think uh, a common, I didn't probe too deeply, but I think a common form of damage is to be guilt-ridden and, and to, you know, or, or to just feel an oppressive sense of conscience uh, or, or feel that, that true forgiveness is forever elusive or whatever. Um, and I'm wondering how common that, first of all, do you recognize that as a real thing that happens to people through a kind of religious upbringing that you would presumably consider misguided, um, and, and, and also kind of how often do you encounter that? How often have you encountered it in, in pastoral situations? Well, that's a very complicated question, really. I'm trying to think of how to answer this in a way that, that's concise and makes sense. I think you could ask the question, why, of all the possible psychologies that I would embrace as a pastoral theologian, I would be so interested in psychoanalysis and continuing to have some interest in Freud, although that's not, you know, Freudian classical psychoanalysis is not my home base, relational psychoanalysis is. But how in the world could you put the atheist Freud together with right. pastoral care? I was, I was going to ask that, so but yeah. go ahead. Uh, because Freud was also very, very concerned about the damage that religion was doing to people and the guilt that it was engendering in small children and, and guilt linked with terror. I mean, Viennese Catholic uh, imagery was awful. Mm -hmm. You know, the flames of hell and, and some of the things that were, were being taught in, in catechism in, in that time and place. And so they were seeing patients who had been really harmed by that. And the whole, again, what I was saying earlier about how often the theologies that are reigning in their day are reflections of the culture uh, as much or more as they are reflections of people's true relationship with the holy. I think his critique really stands and that we are wise to pay attention to that critique. I think he overgeneralized that critique from his context and his experience of 
brutally anti-Semitic Catholicism in turn of the century Vienna. And we have alternatives to other kinds of, of beliefs and other kinds of religious institutions that don't need to be that harsh and damaging to people and don't need to be uh, so incredibly tied up with the hierarchy, both of church and state. Mm-hmm. Because the, the Habsburg monarchy was like this with the Catholic Church in, at that time, and it was a monarchy. Um, I think religion has a lot to say to healing that rift by giving counter narratives to those kinds of guilt mongering, hellfire and brimstone narratives. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I think the category of sin is not something to completely throw out because if you reframe it in a way that people um, do experience more along the lines of feeling alienated from whatever it is that is the source of life, feeling somehow, um, as St. Paul said, I do, the, I do not do the good I want, and I, mm-hmm. the evil that I do not want is what I do. I mean, we all get caught in that at times and feel our own brokenness. I think we have a responsibility to have compassionate uh, responses to that, uh, I don't think we have to give flat-footed doctrinal answers to that, but I think we have a responsibility to take the question seriously. The the second part of what I want to say about all this, though, is I think different eras and different places have different questions. Mm -hmm. And that the question from Freud's time about overbearing guilt gave way in the 20th century, particularly in in Europe and America, to questions of existential anxiety, more about, less about guilt, particularly about sexual behavior and sexual inclination as as what, what Freud saw a lot of, and more anxiety just about why am I here, what is it all about, what, what is the purpose of my life, what will happen when I die. I think that became a real theme of a lot of theology and a lot of psychology in the middle of the 20th century. And I don't think it's surprising when you think about the aftermath of World War II and the atom bomb, the Vietnam War, entering into a war that felt senseless and immoral to so many people as opposed to being in World War II, which people mostly felt like, yes, we're sacrificing things, but we can believe in this, Mm -hmm. we can do this. Um, So there was this whole shift and uh, lack of faith in authority, lack of faith in institutions. And so Mm -hmm. Freud's questions about sexuality and repression and authority really shifted to questions about a larger kind of existential meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think today the questions are shifting again. I see much more preoccupation now with issues of how do I lead a good life in the midst of feeling so entrapped by systems of neoliberal capitalism, for example, and how do we extricate ourselves from systems that seem to have completely taken over all aspects of life that we don't believe in. And so one is, one answer to that is simply buy more stuff and escape it, anesthetize yourself with things. Um, the, other, the other pathway is to try to somehow carve out a way of living within it that still has integrity, even knowing as you're doing that, that there's no purity and that you're somehow colluding with systems you don't agree with. So I think there are new questions, and I would say they're moral and ethical questions, but they're corporate kinds of questions as opposed to necessarily just so very personal, like I am guilty for being a bad person because I have sexual fantasies about my mother. Mm -hmm. You know, those kinds of questions I don't think people are so much engaging, Mm -hmm. but I think people are engaging deep questions about where is the world going now and have we run away with ourselves with with what we're doing to the planet with climate and with racism and all these other big questions that just seem insoluble. Of course, you also speak as someone who is in a particular milieu. I mean, right now you're in the milieu of Union Theological Seminary, which I would say (laughs) is a very particular milieu in terms of ideological resonance and so on. Um, But presumably you're always surrounding yourself by 
within a particular community. So I mean, it, it's kind of hard to. I would think it's kind of hard to control your variables. It's not like it's not like any minister is in touch with America broadly or American Christians broadly or anything else, right? I mean, we have different constituencies, and I don't know what is on the minds of. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. Maybe conservative evangelicals are also, in some sense, feeling oppressed by the machinery of capitalism in some cases. But anyway, my, my, you take my point. Uh, th that uh, uh, Well, I think there's, there's the other path, and I'm not saying all evangelical Christians are on this path by any means. Um, I think we're all, all equally complicit in some degree on this path, but the path of anesthesia, right. the path of consumerism, um, I think... What that links with is a trend that we see more in a shift in the focus of a lot of psychoanalytic theory from neurosis, which mostly has to do with guilt and anxiety, to more concern about what do you do with the person who is narcissistically wounded, who needs to present a perfect exterior, a grandiose, successful self on the outside, keep up with whatever the, the context is that they're living in. And on the inside, actually, if they let themselves, which they seldom do, would feel this vast sense of depletion and emptiness and never getting enough love, never, ever getting enough love. So, And also not being the person they're presenting themselves as, I take it. Right, so that there's so always... Doubts, doubts that, about the authenticity of the person they're pretending to be and the sheer work involved in always pretending to be that person and the, the stress of it. It takes a tremendous amount of energy for people, but often that whole process goes underground and is unconscious. They don't know why mm -hmm. their relationships aren't working. They don't know why they're exhausted and sometimes feeling depressed because they should be on top of the world, but they're not. And, and I would say that's a, a kind of a 20th century concern, and it's still very relevant in, in some class groups. But I also think what's beginning to come in, and maybe this is why if you look much at the issue of multiplicity these days, the multiplicity of the self, and, and grappling with concepts about what is the difference between healthy multiplicity where you are not, um, you're not a monolithic one thing, that, that you can appreciate that there are many, many parts to you that come out in different contexts, some conscious, some more unconscious, mm -hmm. Uh, but what is that as opposed to unhealthy or even traumatic fragmentation, dissociation right. that is not healthy? And how do you get those fragmented pieces talking to each other? I wonder if that isn't also in some way a reflection of the culture now where it feels like there's, so to borrow a word from Jessica Benjamin, there's too much too muchness. Yeah can't take it all in, and we don't know how to relate even to our own environments anymore. Well, it reminds me of this famous uh, sociological book, The Lonely Crowd from the mid-20th century, which distinguished between inner-directed, the traditional kind of person, and the new kind of other-directed person. And maybe I'm oversimplifying, but the other-directed person, I mean, you know, it's partly a shift from kind of character as the key virtue to personality as the key virtue, and it's partly about the shift from having a relatively small number of deep social connections, family and close friends, to having a large number of superficial connections. And that seems to me a trend that has been really consistent. I mean, the number of people who are, you know, in your contacts list, the number of people you in some sense know, has right. I think grown for the average person over decades and decades, but the depth, necessarily, the depth of the average connection has shrunk. And, 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 and different people know different aspects of you, right? Because you're interacting with them for different purposes. And so it just seems natural that a kind of a fragmentation is an issue. And I guess one thing you're, it sounds like one thing you're saying is maybe you, you should accept a multiplicity of, you shouldn't think of a certain degree of multiplicity of selves as a failing on your part and get too freaked exactly. out by it. Right. Um, Multiplicity is, in fact, uh, what I've written about as the goal of therapy, not an integration that hmm. would somehow make you finally be all one thing. Hmm. But all your parts 
hopefully are talking to each other and able to negotiate and work things out. And I don't mean that in a very literal, concrete way, but there's a sense in which you kind of know who's all in there and you kind of know who's coming out at the forefront at different times and you're able to still attend to other parts of yourself that may not be as welcome in a certain context. Mm -hmm. Um, But one of the things that psychoanalysis does is that it helps you to get to know the parts you didn't want to know or that you never knew were there or never even had a voice. Mm -hmm. So that to me seems like a much more healthy and expansive way of understanding the self than trying to hone it all down into one thing. But by the same token, there's always going to be parts of yourself that you don't know and that are going to get stimulated and triggered by certain interactions, and they will make themselves known through what we do Mm -hmm. with other people in relationships. And then you have to grapple with what was the unconscious that came out of me at that moment and and caused me to react in that way that I really wasn't able to have choices about it. So that's part of the maturity process is is the more you learn about what's inside you, the more you have choices, it seems to me, about how you're going to decide to live. Mm-hmm. But, but I wanted to get back to the, the, um, the relationship issue within the lonely crowd that you mentioned because mm-hmm. I think that's the other really important thing and maybe the most important thing about relational theory is that we've gone from thinking about therapy as a kind of a one-person model where if I'm your therapist, Bob, I'm looking at you and the focus is all on you and you're kind of a bug under the glass in my microscope and I'm just this neutral observer who really isn't involved with you, I'm just interpreting you and I'm analyzing you and truthfully I don't think any good psychoanalysis going back to Freud ever was really like that. We, we know that he, he had dogs in his sessions with him, he, he went on walks with people, he invited them to the family dinner table. So it, it, Things have become much more rigid in the practice of the profession than he ever even practiced himself. But we're now talking about a two-person psychology where we have an asymmetry of roles. So if I'm responsible to care for you, it's my job to keep the, to keep the container of that helping relationship safe. I'm not going to exploit you. I'm not going to use you financially or sexually or in some other way. I'm not going to use this relationship for some need of my own. That the purpose of the relationship is a helping relationship. I'm there to help you. But by the same token, there's mutuality of influence. And I'm going to be as influenced by you as you are by me. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call intersubjectivity. It's that there's an unconscious relationship where a lot more is actually going on in the between, between us than either in just you or in just me. Mm -hmm. And that that becomes the focus of the therapy. What is happening here and now, and how are we perceiving it through through subtle signs like enactment, impulses, fantasies, dreams, things that come to us about what's going on in the relationship that may not be so obvious on the surface. And that's what relational psychoanalytic approaches do. Mm And yeah, and that brings us, to, I think, to some some other terminology. I mean, I think I said or suggested early that we would eventually get into a little kind of psychoanalytic terminology. And a couple of big terms that you use in in the book uh, Shared Wisdom are transference and countertransference. Now, I don't; these go back to Freud. They have evolved, uh, and and I don't think we need to get too technical. But let me put it crudely and see how much you think it's necessary to refine this definition for us to proceed to to talk about them. I I mean, at some level, what this refers to is, in a way, what you just said. I mean, with a a, a therapist and a patient, inevitably, the two are reacting to each other as human beings. Uh, I mean, if a therapist, if a male heterosexual therapist has an attractive female patient, it's going to be hard not to, at some level, react the way he would react to any other attractive female person. To take, in a way, what is probably the most famous example of transference in the in the in the literature. I mean, th- this was an issue in Freud's day, right? Problems of of sexual tension and sexual relations and so on. Um, 
and, and in all kinds of other ways. It may, the patient may remind you of your, your estranged son, the patient, you know, and, and vice versa. The, 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 to the patient, the therapist may trigger this. And, and a lot of that may be at the unconscious level. They may not be aware of what's going on. And to a certain extent, these ideas of transference and countertransference refer to just this inevitable dynamic of un largely unconscious reaction to one another that's going to shape the way they interact and could shape it in principle for better or for worse, I guess. Mm -hmm. You want to come to my class and make that speech? That would be great. Oh, would that save you time? That would save me time. <laughs> um, but but the, uh, the key thing is that it's understood to be what's going on mostly at the unconscious level. Mm -hmm. And it presupposes that whatever the dynamics are going on in you and wh whatever theory you want to use to frame that, that you are projecting those dynamics onto the other person and then relating to that other person as if that person were that person, uh, especially from early in life. Mm -hmm. Because there's something that you're doing, just some little thing, some infinitesimal little thing there's enough of a hook that I can hang my projection on that I can go into a full-blown sort of distortion of who you are mm -hmm. because I'm relating to my inner mm -hmm. dynamics instead. And at its deepest, uh, I might even so relate to you in that way that I start getting under your skin and I start evoking in you the very behaviors that replicate what happened to me before. Hmm. And you kind of wonder, what the heck has come over me as I'm sitting with this person? I don't understand this at all. I'm not like myself when I'm there. Mm -hmm. And we encounter those things not just in therapeutic relationships, but in all kinds of relationships, and especially in conflict. People tend to start polarizing and projecting all kinds of things and demonizing each other. Um, so much of the action of psychoanalytic therapy is to allow that transference from the patient to the therapist to occur so that both can experience it and the therapist can in time tactfully comment on it and help the patient grow through insight. Hmm. And the countertransference, counter just means when it's going the other direction, when as a therapist I'm doing the same thing to you, the patient. And I'm, I'm not really relating to you as you are. I'm relating to you through some inner stuff. So that's all the classical definition of all of this. And it's still incredibly important. And it's why practitioners need to do their own work, uh, whether it's through therapy or spiritual direction or healthy relationships or whatever means you have to come to know yourself. But I do believe all therapists should have therapy. You ought to know what it's like to be on the other side of, of the chair or the couch. And... Um, that is not only so that you can kind of empathize with what it's like to be the client or the patient, but it's also so you know what that stuff is that's likely to come out and be triggered by certain people who come to you. What's happening now, though, in this contemporary psychoanalytic thinking is, again, looking at it as a much more two-way street and thinking that because of that possibility of feelings and thoughts and fantasies being invoked in the other person, that... I may be having a very strong feeling in reaction to you and I need to check myself to see if it's one of my old things that I know about and it might even be that in part. But could it also be that I am somehow picking up because of this intersubjective field that we share, that we've created together, I'm picking up on something about your experience that you can't talk about yet and yet somehow You've put it into the pool that's there between us. I've gone into that pool with you to try to understand, and I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. And I've had this happen to me as a therapist time and time again, where a feeling that seems to be not at all what's being talked about in the room is what's coming up. Is there a classic kind of example where... Uh, sure. I'll give you a, an example I use in, in my teaching that, say... Let's take it back to the level of pastoral care even. It doesn't have to be in psychotherapy. What's different between therapy and care is in therapy, you're actually focusing on it and you're talking about it and you're going for the unconscious, which is not the responsibility of a pastoral caregiver. Mm -hmm. You're going to open cans of worms that you don't know what to do with. Mm -hmm. But in pastoral care, you still can notice these things happening and be attentive to them and, and wonder what it might mean. So say... Um, 
a mother comes in and is wanting to talk with you about wedding planning. Very common pastoral encounter, right? It's mm -hmm. not even someone coming to you with a problem per se. And she starts talking about, in a kind of a flat tone of voice about, I'm very excited. This is going to be a great event. We've got everything ready. I just need to check with you about writing the check for the organist and what do you need? And you're just picking up that there's this, she's saying she's excited and happy and she's flat. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's a sort of obvious example that you could observe physically. But now let's say you're observing the flatness, you're hearing the words of excitement, they don't match so well. And then suddenly you just start feeling in her presence really, really anxious. And you don't think it's what you had for breakfast, mm -hmm. and you don't think it's what somebody else said to you earlier in the day. It just seems like it's coming up between you, and yet she hasn't said anything about anxiety. She hasn't presented herself as anxious. If anything, she's presented herself as strangely calm, mm -hmm. and you're feeling anxious. That would be the kind of thing to pay attention to. Now, depending on how well you know this person, you might or might not even broach it. But I would certainly say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like, I would address what I see, which would be that first level. You know, I'm feeling like there's something kind of flat about the way we're both talking about this. I'd bring myself into it. And I'm wondering if there's more going on here that, that you're having some feelings about this wedding that you want to talk about. In which case she might be able to address, well, you know, my father died. Now I'm making this up, but my father died a year ago, and I can't help thinking how different this would have been if he had been here. Mm -hmm. So you get the flatness. Now in therapy, I might also address the anxiety. Because it's so unconscious, and you don't even know where it's coming from, I wouldn't do that in a pastoral care encounter. But I might, if this were my patient, say, I'm also, maybe this is just me and it's nothing to do with you, but I'm also feeling a kind of level of anxiety in the room. Does that say anything to you about what's going on with you? Mm -hmm. And then let her decide if she wants to go there or not. So there's a lot of leeway for saying no. Mm -hmm. And you don't go, go mm -hmm. digging for it. But she might recognize it. Mm -hmm. That you're giving a name to something that she's kind of tossed over to you through that intersubjective relationship, that you're feeling it. She doesn't know it yet, but she's feeling it. Mm -hmm. So you, and so in writing about pastoral care from a psychoanalytic perspective, you're not, you're not trying to turn people who give pastoral care and counseling into full-blown psycho, th psychotherapists or act the way psychotherapists would. It sounds like you're, you, you want to make them conscious enough of unconscious dynamics kind of emanating from the other person to make some use of them, although not the kind of use that a therapist might make, and also at the same time to perhaps be more conscious of their own reactions, largely unconscious reactions that may get in the way if they're not careful. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I actually think a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing, so um, teaching psychoanalytic theory to people without giving it a really good framework of understanding what's the purpose of that would not be necessarily a healthy thing, like to turn out a lot of pseudo-therapists. Mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of damage done by people who thought they knew more than they did, and then they didn't know what to do if they opened yes. up a, an abuse scenario that they weren't prepared for, for example. Um, but I, I think self-awareness is key. I would like to say that it's key to everything we do in life, that the more self-aware we are, the better off we are, and I suppose you could say that just as much as I have certain religious beliefs, I also have certain firmly held psychological beliefs. And one of them is that there is an unconscious realm mm -hmm. and it's bigger than the conscious realm. And you ought to get to know it because if you don't, it will make itself known and not necessarily in the most pleasant ways. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, now we, I promised that we would touch at least a little on theology. So before we wrap up, let's do a little of that. I, I want to start by saying something that occurred to me long, not long ago and is relevant to this business we discussed earlier about a, a judgmental, uh, maybe wrathful, oppressive God versus a loving God. One thing I realized not long ago is that when I was a, a child in a Southern Baptist church, 
I actually mapped that distinction between a harshly judgmental God and a loving God, not onto the Old Testament versus New Testament God, but it was more an intra-Trinity thing in the sense that I kind of thought of God as the bad cop and Jesus as the good cop. In other words, Ooh, yeah. God was the source of judgment. The, the, God was the thing whose judgment I feared. Jesus was the one who loved me unconditionally. And you can, you can kind of see, I guess, how that would happen. Is this, have you heard that, or does that, does that ring a bell? <laughs> I don't think it's as common in my Anglican tradition. <laughs> I wouldn't think. <laughs> uh, or, I mean, for, for a period of time, I also, um, through my musical background, I, I went into the UCC church for a period of time and then came back to the Episcopal church. So you wouldn't hear it that much there either. But I definitely think that it's a trope that's problematic in Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, good cop, bad cop. And then, you know, the spirit. How would you describe the spirit in that paradigm? I, I didn't have it worked out very systematically, I think. I, I, I don't think I had a... I probably thought of the Holy Ghost back then as roughly mapping on to Casper the Friendly Ghost. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, or, or somehow the thread that connects us to to these well, other two guys. Right? Yeah, you're way over my head, at least my, ni okay. my nine-year-old head when you say that. But, right, uh, right, right, right. The Trinity is sort of an abstract concept. At best. Um, <laughs> I guess, I haven't encountered it a lot, but I recognize it as something that lives in Christian tradition. And I'm, I'm flashing back to that book, The Shack. Don't know it. Oh, it's hugely popular out there. Um, it's where this, this guy who's kind of in a despairing state, goes out into the woods and runs into God and Jesus and the Spirit mm -hmm. in this old shack and um, learns to forgive his abuser in this process. Mm -hmm. You can hear from my tone of voice, I'm not a fan of this book. Sounds like it. Um, I think it, it has all kinds of disturbing racial stereotypes because God is the mammy in this book. Um, Jesus is the white guy who's the carpenter and kind of the guy you can really relate to. And the spirit is an Asian woman. Hmm. And they basically set everything up for him to have an experience that I find to be incredibly manipulative, if not coercive, that he must forgive his abuser. And in the back of the book, there's even a footnote that that comments that, you know, if you want to make these books available at battered women's shelters, you, it's, it's just appalling to me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that kind of relates to what I think you're talking about, except that in this instance, all three of them are super loving and they just are mm -hmm. super loving in different ways. But mm -hmm. it is God and Jesus both who, who kind of tell this guy, you must be a forgiving person in this particular way to be saved. And, um, I mean, I think that goes, again, back to the sort of sin and judgment trope that we're all sinners, we're all forgiven by God, we should all forgive others because we're forgiven by God, and that judgment and mercy are these sort of balance scales that we don't quite have control over or understand how they work, and finally God's going to put the tilt on the side of mercy, but that there's always this, this judgment hanging in the balance mm -hmm. as well. Um, it's not how I approach the Trinity at all, actually. I, I think, uh, well, I've written about the Trinity in, in the book that came after Shared Wisdom in thinking about a pastoral Trinity as creative profusion, the, the God the Creator as the first person of the Trinity, that, that that manifests in life everywhere. We don't separate, we don't have to separate the incarnation from just Jesus is the only way in which God is human or God is, is present in this life and then God is this kind of prime mover somewhere else mm -hmm. and that the Spirit maybe is, is the way we can connect. So I think of God as, as the creative power in, in creation. I think of the second person of the Trinity as incarnation and the ways in which um, human love and desire are expressed through relationship as Jesus came into the earth and 
had relationships and loved and died, and we also die. And then I think of the Holy Spirit um, as the word inspiration, that the Holy Spirit is where through that that mystical connection between breath and the spiritual life that we can sense all of this and relate to one another. So they're, they're all connected to each other. And that, that sense of connection, I use the image of an icon uh, of the, the mysterious visitors under the tree at Mamre who come to visit Isaac and, and Sarah. And in this icon by Rubloff, they're sitting at a table and they're all leaning toward each other, but there's also this opening. And if you gaze into the icon long enough, you find that there's a place in their communion for you. You can join in with them. And there's a chalice with a patent in the middle of the table, which is the feast. Okay. So that to me is the whole different framing than the idea that one represents judgment, one represents mercy, and one, I don't know how that kind of fits in that paradigm other than to help us to know that we need to be better. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what you were saying about your conception of the Trinity uh, seems to bear some kind of correspondence to this paradigm you've called inner subjectivity. Yes. Uh, of, uh, which is your kind of, I guess, psychiatric paradigm or, or psychological paradigm, right? Your therapeutic paradigm. Um, well, they're both, they're both, the Trinity as a theological symbol and intersubjectivity as a concept are both profoundly relational ideas. Mm -hmm. And rather than do my theologizing from a presupposed set of doctrines that are up here, and now I'm going to take those doctrines and somehow figure out how to press them into the template of experience which is the way a lot of traditional theology has been done. And actually, so has a lot of traditional psychology. Psychological theory, you could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Instead of that, I'm, uh, well, this is m very much part of the method of most practical theologians, is to start with human experience, particularly the experience of suffering, and to ask what are both the psychological realities and the theological or spiritual uh, needs and expressions that arise out of that experience of suffering. Mm -hmm. And to put those together in a way that is congruent with one another, but also with the human experience and what is helpful. Mm -hmm. So for me, if relationality is the paradigm that, that grows out of human need, and that humans are multiple and fluid and dynamic and relational, would we not also want to conceptualize God in similar terms, that God doesn't need to be a monolithic statue on a throne, that God also can be living and fluid and relational and dynamic and present to us in our experience. Okay, and final question, and I think this is connected to what you just said. Uh, the, you know, theology is to some extent uh, an attempt to reconcile conceptions of God with modern thought more generally. Uh, you know, and, and that, that may be, you know, partly helps account for a certain amount of uh, novelty and evolution in theological thought, I think. But one kind of theology that I think is often taken as a particularly modern kind of theology is process theology, mm -hmm. which goes back to people like Alfred North Whitehead about 100 years ago. You just want to, before we go, uh, give us your thumbnail definition of process theology and say anything uh, about it you want to say? Well, process theology, as you say, it comes out of Whitehead and others, uh, other philosophers in this notion that um, the world is, is inherently moving in a direction of some kind of growth and that it's a kind of a progress model. Mm -hmm. And the idea is if you could get out of the way and leave things alone, uh, they would naturally unfold in, mm -hmm. in beauty, truth, and goodness. And that that is always what's unfolding, even when a bad thing happens, that um, whether you want to think of that in theistic terms or not theistic terms, which philosophy didn't necessarily always posit, you can say that God or the divine or this force of goodness is always going to be back in there pitching 
to heal what, what's damaged and to continue to move on in a good way. And you can see why that would be very congenial as a theology for pastoral care and counseling, because if we believe that people are inherently able to grow, otherwise why do therapy at all? Mm-hmm. Um, and that growth and change is, is a part of moving into greater and greater fullness of life. There's a really nice correspondence there. I will say in my own theologizing, I've moved a bit beyond pure process just because I think there are a lot of, well, there's a lot of linearity to it, and I'm not sure that from a psychoanalytic point of view, I can justify saying that everything is getting better every day in every way. Mm -hmm. I don't see the evidence for that. So I see... In, in relationship and in the capacity we have for relationship and for justice and love, that sparks of the divine are percolating up and out all the time. Do we pay attention when we see them? I'm not sure it's all rolling in a direction that's better than before. I'm not sure that we are better off spiritually than people in the Middle Ages or people in the caves. You know, I, I think every spirituality for its own time has its own gifts. But I do think paying attention to where goodness comes back into situations, and this is the part of process that still really appeals to me. I don't think God causes bad things to happen, either as a lesson. I mean, this is another theme you get in pastoral care a lot. I don't think God causes bad things to happen as a lesson. I don't think God causes bad things to happen as punishment. Um, I think bad things happen because we live in a messy world where there is freedom, and that comes straight out of process thought. To be made in the image of God, to some extent, is to be made God-like in our ability to choose, and we don't always choose well. But at the same time, I think God is always in the mix, or the holy, or however you want to language that, making things possible. And we still have choices whether we're going to follow the possible into a better path or not. Mm-hmm. But the possible is always there. And even the impossible, now I'm quoting Jean-Luc Marion, but even the impossible, in some sense, God's, any kind of God, it, God itself is beyond what we can know as possible that I think we can, we can be attentive. And I think religious practice in many traditions is, is actually about being attentive to that movement of, of the possible, impossible, the good within us, and trying to latch on to that and go in that direction as opposed to some other direction. Okay. Well, on that note, I will try to go in that direction. That will be my vow going forward after this conversation. Try to go in the good and as a meditator, don't you think that there's a way in which meditation also participates in that, that you're, you're tending to something? Yeah. To yourself. I mean, I think, of, uh, I think of meditation as largely uh, tending to liberate me, not liberating me fully, but when it's working, tending to liberate me from the things that would lead me to make bad decisions and, and react in unconstructive ways. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, when it's working. And even if you think of that as sort of a detachment, right, yeah. from, from the things that entrap us and seduce us, that there's a way in which that is a practice of attending to what is life-giving. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's kind of controversial within meditation Buddhist circles whether you should describe it as a process of detachment. Um, for technical reasons, some would rather you call it non-attachment when you're talking about your relationship to your feelings, your relationship to your feelings, but I think detachment is a fine term. There's the further irony that sometimes, sometimes the way you get the detachment is actually, by in a certain sense, associating more closely with your feelings, associating with your feelings more uncritically ironically, allows mm-hmm. you to acquire a critical distance from them, however strange that sounds. But just not fighting them, you know, just accepting them, okay, this is what sadness feels like, okay, this is anxiety. Ironically, that kind of acceptance can give you a critical distance from them. And, that's, and, right. and, and that's what, what can be liberating. 
um, it, it's not magic. And in, in my experience, how much good it's doing you is in direct proportion how much time you're spending doing it and with how much dedication. Um, right. It's not like a one. It's not like a one-time liberation that's uh, you know saves you for the rest of your life. But um, but yeah, it, it, I think it 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 helps you make better decisions and have fewer counterproductive reactions. Well, and I'm not trying to impose a kind of a Christian or, or even a Catholic spiritual template on meditation, Buddhist meditation, and say, you know, it's really the same thing as attending to the movement of the Holy Spirit. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not making an equation there. But I think that um, making space, however you understand that, in, in many religious traditions, there's a, there's a practice of making space that mm -hmm. does give you the capacity to observe yourself in a different way. And interestingly, that is also what psychoanalysis tries to do. Hmm. That is interesting. And space is a good metaphor. That seems like a good description of what meditation feels like at its best. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of, of uh, spaciousness and correspondingly less kind of um, encroachment or entrapment by the parts of you that are not helpful. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> um, so... Well, good. So we've, uh, I think we've, we've uh, achieved some sort of interfaith uh, insight. Um, the, um, I want to thank you for coming on um, as I uh, silence my cell phone. Uh, lovely holy music tinkling in the background. Yeah, it is a nice ringtone, don't you think? <laughs> I, I chose it myself from among a menu of about seven that I was offered. Um, so again, <laughs> again, Shared Wisdom, one of several books people could read of yours. Uh, it's about uh, pastoral care from a, from a somewhat therapeutic uh, point of view. But you've also got a book of essays called Braided Selves. Uh, the book on violence against women called The Cry of Tamarin. And there's, another, there's at least a fourth book, right? Many Voices is a book that takes the whole concept of intersubjectivity and applies it specifically in pastoral psychotherapy mm -hmm. with a much more involved theological uh, like a third of the book is is a very involved, constructive, theological uh, working out of some of the things that come at the end of Shared Wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then actually my spouse, Michael, who is president of this uh, theological seminary at Gettysburg, hmm. Pennsylvania, and I last summer wrote a book, uh, or two summers ago, wrote a book on um, exploring practices of ministry, where we look at the ways in which the different practical theological fields might be entered by someone who's just beginning to think about going mm -hmm. into ministry or theological studies and kind of laying out the territory. Hmm. Those are the books. Okay, and wait, what, what's that book called? Exploring Practices of okay. Ministry. Okay, good. Um, well, thanks, thanks again, and maybe we'll do this down the road. I think there's a lot of things we haven't talked about yet. There's always going to be more. Yes, there will. Okay. Well, thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.